And this is a file for radio, which is why this is the audio too. Could have just played that, I guess. That you miss out on my melodic voice. That you. Ah, Bertha is here. Shouldn't it though? Shouldn't it? There's a lot of things that should be a standard, right? And yet, no, no, you gotta fight for every little piece of decency that a government does because otherwise, a government in America just starts at zero. Starts at just, you know, market mechanisms. Let us continue. I will stop at 11th latest. Maybe just one more story. How about we just read one more? Um, what? No, not that one. Not that one. Okay, let's do this one. Let's keep it in, uh, with uh, positive news. You see uh, the top, this is from True Power. In their economy and labor section. Garment workers win historic victory in an effort to transform fashion industry. Let's check out where. Bangladesh. Of course. Of course. It's always where things are worst. This is where accelerationism kind of has like a point, or at least like why, how does anyone think accelerationism is valid as a line? Tendency. The idea that things have to get really bad before they can get better, or bad before people will be forced to act, because I think it's not a thing, it's a philosophy, that you, you do what is necessary, or the best thing to do is what is necessary appropriately at each time. You know, people unionize when it's totally necessary, that they cannot survive otherwise. People unionize in Bangladesh, these women garment workers, because rules were dropping on their heads. You know, you get a job when you absolutely have to get a job, or whatever kind of job it is. You know, you have to work three jobs because it is necessary to make your rent in the way you are and whatnot. Um, you know, it's necessary to provide basic, you know, basic income or basic job guarantee when it is completely necessary for capitalism to continue or the society that we have whether it's capitalist or not this is posted originally published by waging nonviolence so this is shared by truth out waging nonviolence i suggest you check them out i once went to a book reading or book signing or book uh, discussion with someone, uh, an author of that of this blog, waging nonviolence are the kind of radical, direct action anti-war activists that, yes, still exist, but are never, rarely talked about, promoted, because it's just so unfashionable, even in the lefty spaces, to talk of to really to do direct action against the military-industrial complex. It's just not complain about it but to actually take action again. But waging nonviolence is a bit different in that although they are old hippies who, in during the Vietnam days, did actually talk of planning on, you know, uh, knowing that certain tra trains carrying ammo to, be, to, the, to the war effort were coming down this track and they were gonna block those tracks. They were gonna hold it up like the boat in the Suez. Just Delay the ammo from getting to, to Vietnam. And that would cause another loss in the war, or or, or it would uh, delay the uh, you know operation just a little bit, and just make the war that much harder to keep going. But one thing that a waging nonviolence person described was they would do sine waves, just one person or so, outside of the plants. Uh, war, you know, army plants, not army plants, army. the defense contractors, you know, uh, the Ray Rayon. Um, and the signs were directed sort of at the workforce going in and out, but also the truck drivers delivering, uh, doing it. And it wasn't really effective. 
but they would get some people who would come to them later and say, I quit that job because your sign made a point having to see it every day, being reminded that I'm helping kill me. I'm helping, I'm a cog in the effort that kills people and doesn't defend anyone. It doesn't make the world safer. So that's ways of nonviolence. In March 2020, but this is about labor struggle here. In March 2020, Amanda De Lee, uh, Lee McCarty was laid off from her job. For years, she had been working in the fashion industry as a buyer and developer. But as COVID-19 cases surged and lockdown orders were implemented across the world, retailers were faced with a dramatic plummet in consumer demand for clothing. People were still spending money, right? They couldn't spend money on food, fine dining who had been the sole breadwinner in her family for most of her life, was left without a steady income or health insurance, because I do job. Bullshit. Cardi wasn't the only one in the global apparel industry whose future was thrust into uncertainty. Thousands of miles away, countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Cambodia, apparel factories had just received catastrophic news from retailers in the West. In order to offset the financial losses of the pandemic, businesses made a swift and nearly universal decision since they have the power and authority to do so. Tyrants they are. Or tyrants directed by the market. Not them, it's not their decision. The God, the market. The great chain. I'm playing Bioshock, so I'm going to say the great chain. This wasn't theoretical money. Elizabeth Klein, who works with the consumer activist nonprofit Remake. Oh, okay, sorry, they made the decision. They were going to steal $40 billion from their most vulnerable workers. The wage fact. This was garment workers not being paid for work that was already done. Which makes it slavery. For many brands, this theft was not only legal, but outlined in their contracts with factories overseas. Which enabled them to cancel orders at any time. Retailers cited a major Manure clause, manure clause, I haven't read that word in a long time, to claim that they didn't need to take clothing they had ordered before the pandemic. And they also didn't have to pay for it, even if the product had already been made after hundreds of hours of painstaking labor. Yes, because, you know, it's not the labor you're paying for, it's the product. So if you don't pay for the product, no revenue, no ability to pay wages. Funny how easy this whole market relations, everyone wins, breaks down when you actually meet the real world. This decision was enforced by nearly all the world's most profitable apparel companies, only 20 of whom control about 97% of industry profits. Among the offenders, Walmart, Sears, Kohl's, Nike, Forever 21, H&M, Gap, Adidas, Children's Place, and Ross stores. We do not have a Ross store in New York, but I know. What followed was one of the largest transfers of wealth from the Global South to the West in recent history, at least because it was all in one sum, all, among all other transfers of wealth. The effect of the cancellations were immediate. No severance pay. But wealthy fashion brands continue to deliver shareholder payouts. I'm going to keep getting paid. Workers already living in poverty were plunged even deeper into debt and starvation. You know, streamers like Vosh, like, they, they seem mad for a reason, because like, you know, they're trying to make more socialist. And so it's okay that they're angry, right? But it kind of needs to be directed to the right person. Us office, we are really angry. We're angry at a system that does this to people. It makes us super angry and sad. Because we know it can be better. And here, and the story has a somewhat happy ending. Because this wasn't just cutting wages, 
you know, doing things that are illegal, allowed by our system. No, they, they were stealing the wages. That. So they, they went a little too far, and they maybe didn't get away with it this time. But wealthy frat fashion brands continued to deliver shareholder payouts. Workers already living in poverty plunged deeper into debt and starvation. Why were companies so comfortable robbing their factories in the middle of the largest humanitarian crisis of our lifetimes? Fine said. It had a lot to do with the fact that the people imparted or impacted were in the global south. They were women of color. Companies were used to being able to subjugate without consequence. No consequences? Who gives a fuck, right? Who they thought they were going to who they thought weren't going to stand up to them. They rarely did in the past, though they certainly did when roof fell down on them. This was a factory in Bangladesh during the earthquake. Kind of their version of the oh, triangle waste coast waste shirt factory. But the companies were wrong. In a matter of days, a movement was born. Prize of NGOs. Um, thousands of garment workers. Grassroots organizers. Organizers super important. And consumers on our side of things. They named their first campaign after the primary demand. Pay up. I find it odd that I had not heard of this in the last few months. Let's review where this was filed. This was last month. Came and went in a week. I guess it's good that it did. Maybe I just don't pay enough time in certain types of social media. It was one of the most successful labor rights campaigns in the fashion industry in modern times. Uh, because by last month, PayUp had secured $22 billion from brands who had initially refused to pay, lay bare the exploitation fundamental to the global supply chain. The kind that Bosch kind of, um, just to point out, like, I'm not... We call them pedophile, pedophile or defender of child porn because he said the child porn exploitative. And it isn't, his argument is that it's, it's only as exploitative as everything else that's made in the global south. So it's morally the same. And unless you are supported or you're part of campaigns like Pay Up, then, but you're going to, you know, if, 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 he argued that it was hypocritical, that, you know, it's easy to be against child porn because it's so, but only leftists, good leftists, will also be against this type of exploitation and say, that has to be banned too. The kind of global supply of a, the industry that does this to people. But... The difference is the product and the process of getting that product are both disgusting. While in the case of global apparel and clothes, the product isn't really the problem. It's the process and the social relations that produce it. It's bad only in the means, not in the result. Such a tangent, but I'm on Twitch, so if you know when I mention these things, right, that that hits some beats, right. This is an industry that's a part of everyone's life, but nobody really knows what happens behind the scenes. I mean, hey, maybe some of that, some of that apparel uh, comes from the uh, Uyghur, uh, Uyghur factories in China. They're not factories that make Uyghurs; they're the factories that Uyghurs are. Uh, some Uyghurs are being um, kind of shipped to. To work in job, uh, you know, move people where the jobs are. If a brand is refusing to pay up, it's likely they're paying slave wages in the first place and not caring about the climate and burning billions of dollars of access clothing everywhere. Yes, and there's access clothes surplus. It's just burned, and you get to write that off on your taxes. It does not, because if it takes Five dollars to dispose of something. 
you do that if it takes six dollars to give the product to someone else to donate it because when it comes down to like you have this surplus of something why don't you donate it to someone why don't you find someone who needs this right planning economic planning of surplus cannot be done on an individual by individual basis it's a lot of labor to do that and it certainly costs more in time and maybe even physically money to do that than it takes to toss it in a dumpster this is where economic planning has to be democratic and can be democratic but i'll even if it was top down, I would consider it a plus because it would mean less shit going in the dump. You know, I mean that there's a surplus of clothes; it gets given off to someone. Food doesn't go into dumpsters; it gets, it goes to the to the food uh, pantry. Now you don't need full socialism to have a law like France has or Paris. It requires all supermarkets to send their surplus to uh, food pantries. And I know of many supermarkets in my area that have, if not voluntarily, but it's kind of been organized by the county food pantry to kind of, for PR purposes too, but to get uh, every supermarket as possible. They've lobbied with them directly, built relationships and all that. Uh, to get them to send their uh, surplus, their uh, you know pallets of stuff that didn't sell, or you know, maybe it's expired a little bit. Usually, stuff that didn't sell, um, or they order too much of, or something like that. Sale items, and uh, and you just can't take um, just can't slice uh, slash the price anymore. So. Uh, it's not required by law in our area, but most of that stuff is now going to the county food pantry, which is really big. Um, so much so that even they have stuff that goes bad in the warehouse. They don't get it out the door. Mostly because they're a nonprofit and it's a, a lot of their labor has to be volunteer that way. Uh, there's only so many people they can hire to pay to get it out. Yeah, and it never even costs labor. And if you have to pay for wages for labor, then um, wages have to, you know, that has to be, you need revenue. So you can never really do anything socially valuable. Socially value, valuable labor, labor is punished. So they held brands accountable. They have testimony from garden workers. Wait, wait, let's, let's hold back here okay from its foundation pay up strategy has been discerned which brands are movable and to then target those brands using grassroots pressure or cancel campaigns i guess we knew if we were going to wait for fashion brands to gain a conscience nothing was going to change there was public knowledge who canceled so we had a list of companies and the amount of money they owed but we needed a bigger picture of what was happening because of this well you could use marxism to capitalism as a big picture here because of this, the testimony of garment workers themselves have been critical to the success of payup. In November 2020, Worker Rights Authority released a survey of garment workers who lost jobs across many countries. Cambodia, Bangladesh, El Salvador, Ethiopia, Haiti, Indonesia, the Simfo, and Myanmar. Afghanistan, Nearly 75% of these workers reported going into debt to buy food since the pandemic began. And described skipping meals. You know, unable to afford food or protein. Government workers who remain employed, many of whom were working overtime to produce personal protective equipment. And you have to work an extra hour so you get a freaking mask. Even of the world's most profitable brands saw an 11% increase in value. By the summer of 2020, PayUp had been shared on social media many times. Millions of times. Strange, I didn't see it. Oh, a change.org petition. Oh, those were... Um, it was sent to executives. It garnered 300,000 signatures. 
Behind the scenes, NGOs and activist groups like Remake, Workers' Rights, and Clean Clothes Campaign moved in tandem to negotiate with the brand. Right, so it's not enough to just send angry emails and petition. Petition is simply leverage for the negotiators, the act, the organizers, the leaders. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Oh, you know I've been talking like I didn't have any water. This pressure was combined with direct action by workers around the world. There's no wrong answer. The toolbox, toolbox of petitions, of having uh, experienced negotiators, direct action. What did, what did the direct action tendency do? In response to factory shutdowns that left thousands in the apparel industry without jobs, workers in Miramar went on strike. Eventually, securing a wage bonus and union recognition through a two-week sit-in. Like to read more? Maybe I should read more on that. You know, how to successfully do a sit-in for two weeks? Well, actually, no. Actually, it's easy. The sit-in part is probably key. If you do like a walkout strike that allows for hiring of scabs, uh, for lockouts. This is where strikes go awry in America. It's gotta be a sit-in. You gotta like make sure that you're holding, occupying the building. I'm not sure why people didn't learn this this uh, this lesson from Occupy Wall Street. You gotta take space. That's the only thing that finance can't stop. If you take space, they have to rely on the police to physically move you. And if you can turn the police on your side or public opinion enough so that the police can move against you, you've won. In Cambodia, around 100 workers marched to the Ministry of Labor to submit a petition. Small march, but still, hundreds a good number. When they weren't offered a resolution, protesters continued to the Prime Minister's house, where they were blocked by nearly 50 police officers. This reminds me of a clip uh, from Anthropology 101 where we watched a documentary and it was showing a riot occur, or at least protesters fighting cops. And the voiceover in the kind of David Attenborough nature documentary style was like, and here we see the gang of cops and the gang of activists engaged in conflict over territory. <laughs> It wasn't quite that language, but it, that's what it invoked. That uh, these were both social groups that were fighting over their place in society. You know, who was more important? Who was who had leverage? Similar actions took place in Pakistan after factories cut holiday bonuses. It was international, baby. It doesn't happen in one country. And on in the West, the are our purpose, our our um our place was to back them up, right? To support the workers in the south. You know that's kind of what it means to to be an ML, America. Uh, put everything towards stopping the harm on our end by fighting military industrial complex, by sending petitions to corporations, because we're for the most part their customers. They care. Somewhat about our public opinion. And they don't need to care about public opinion in Bangladesh. Um, so it's kind of their job to strike and protest. Our job to kind of put on a happy face and negotiate on the global South behind. Maybe. In Bangladesh, garment workers who staged protests outside factories were also met with opposition, with many workers reporting that they had been attacked by police with the usual bullshit. While they were uh, with tear gas, while they were sleeping. Huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, cause I guess they were taking maybe taking shifts on a picket line. Uh, yeah, because they, they were outside a factory. 
Okay, if it's if if it's not if it's not a sit-in, the police can just get at you. Um, throwing tear gas inside, I, I guess they could do it. It's, it's, it's gonna be hard. They can't shoot with water cannons and be with batons. It's more defensible, you know. Uh, to date, twenty-one brands monitored by PayUp have committed to paying for canceled orders in full, unlocking a total. $22 billion for factories and garment workers globally. 18 brands have still refused to pay. Many have deleted hashtag pay up comments on their social media accounts in an attempt to shut down the conversation. Well, I guess uh, we should do our part. Uh, if you're active on Twitter or whatever, tweet pay up to uh, go to the pay up with uh, campaign and see who you can harass. Put your harassing skills to good use online, the left Twitter. This is what left Twitter needs to be doing. Oh, whatever bullshit they're arguing about or canceling each other or whatever, arguing about left tubers, Vosh good or Vosh bad, just ship post corporations all the time. Because there likely are real campaigns that would benefit people in the global south. Now, it's not going to be me because I'm not some online ship poster. It's not my place. It's not my role. But if anything, a story like this shows it's that every tactic has its place. It needs its people to do it. Now, the only worry I ever had is are there enough people to do all the roles? You know, if you only have five people, you can't fill all the roles to have like the successful campaign. Or we got to recruit enough people to do a good campaign. Get enough attention, recruit enough people. And the people who recruit also have, also have to have that diversity of skills. You know, the people who are good at, uh, you know, who have the clout to negotiate on our behalf. The people who are shit posters to harass online. The people to do the direct action, we're defying them, we've been trained, who are gung-ho and, and toxic enough to just be really mean at the right people. And, and the people organizing all the other stuff. And, and, the, and the, the healers who, you know, medical tech. And, and all those roles. This is longer than I thought. Let's skip ahead to the end here. Around the same time PayUp was founded, McCarty, McCarty utilized her insider experience to launch Clothes Horse, a podcast exposing dark truths about the world of fast fashion. It was the start of a new chapter, an inadvertent decision to never return to the industry, no matter the financial consequences. Coming from a lower class background, it's been challenging knowing what goes on behind the scenes and having to keep going. For so long, I felt like a hamster running in a wheel, going to this toxic, abusive job that I hated. There is something very strange and liberating about no longer having a job, because now I can speak the truth about it. I'll get back to that. I'll, let me finish. I'll finish first. Over the course of more than 20, 60 episodes, Closed Horse has explored the issues of labor rights, greenwashing, consumerism, and the pay-up movement. Party also features the stories of retail workers who can call through a hotline to speak about common practices such as non-disclosure agreements, wage theft, requirements that unsold merchandise be destroyed. You know, you can't take that shirt for yourself. That's company property. The company says, throw it in the furnace. A lot of people found their lives completely upside down last year. We've all been getting educated about things that we weren't before. Oh. It's amazing that we were all able to find each other and respond to one another's ideas. I feel so lucky that at least once a week I start to cry. Here's a joy. As PayUp enters its second year of campaigning, this kind of community building could prove essential, ensuring the movement doesn't lose momentum. How like uh, maybe how Extinction Rebellion, or maybe they're still going, but I don't really feel like the energy is there. PayUp was able to reveal the inner workings of this power dynamic that was hidden from view for a long time. 
That's made it much easier to propose reforms, but everyone has to be ready to fight for the long haul. Fashion industry we want to see is going to take commitment and perseverance. And I want to point out that this person has been able to be a leader because she left the industry. That I'm not working as an insider anymore. Got to be an outsider. Really have that impact. Point two. Why am I not an architect? Well, I didn't work in the architecture industry. But I did go to school for architecture for six years. And in doing so, I also had professors who were all working. They were all active working architects. So there were many times, uh, and some of them would take us to their office for a tour, see how things work. And also in my studies in theory and history, and present in the magazines, in the, you know, the architecture beats and the magazines, newspaper, and being in New York City, I learned enough about how things worked to be disgusted by how things worked. To know that it was not a profession I wanted to be a part of. You know, to go through all the hoops, professional hoops, would it would put me in this position of, as she said, uh, I'm going to a toxic, abusive job that I would probably grow to hate. Um, and you have to spend five years drawing your knots. 